yeah, welcome to some more uh, text analysis with R. Um, we've done some text analysis like ages ago and we've been really kind of wanting to get back um, into it. Uh, so that's what we're, what we're doing today. And I'm going to share my um, R Studio uh, screen. Let me know if uh, the size of it is good or if you want, yeah, if I should make it a little bit bigger or if it's okay. Maybe a little bit bigger. A little bit bigger? At least for my tiny screen. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Can't hurt, right? Okay, great. Yeah, so today we'll be talking about topic modeling and we have um, a link here at the top. So this is from a book, Tidy Text Mining by Julia Silge and David Robinson. If you want to read more about it and see some more examples, you can follow that link. Um, so topic modeling generally is um, a method that um, allows us to say, okay, we want to divide a large text base that consists of several documents into some groups. So two, three, four, five, however many groups we want. Um, if you're at all familiar with clustering on numeric data, not text data, but numeric data, it's a bit similar, but for text. Um, and this is unsupervised. And what that means is that we don't give any we don't, we don't give any labels to these categories. We just say it's that number of categories. And then it's a little bit like a black box. Like we don't know um, exactly um, how this is going to be um, assigned. We just say a number of topics, but we don't label them. We can't label them um, in this uh, topic modeling process, basically. And there are different algorithms and different methods of um, doing this. The one that we'll use today, and that's also a very common one, is called latent um, Dirichlet allocation. And I'll abbreviate that to LDA because I can, I always struggle to remember how to pronounce Dirichlet. I hope that's like close to correct. And yeah, this is one common algorithm for topic modeling, um, but not the only one. And to go into a little bit more detail um, in how the, on, on how this works. So every document um, and documents can be things like newspaper articles. We'll, we'll do that in a second as an example. So every document consists of a mixture of topics. So um, document one might be 80% one topic and then 15% another topic and then 5% a third topic so it can be divided um, like 80, 15, 5 or a different document might be more equally from all three topics that we have or another document might be 95% from one topic and only 5% from another or other topics. Um, so a document consists of a mix of topics. It's not just one topic, but it can be a mix of different topics. And then every topic is or consists of a mixture of words. Um, so let's say we have these newspaper texts, newspaper um, articles, and we classify them into two topics. And then one topic might be, we might look at it and say, well, this seems to be more politics. So again, we can't these are labels that we have to give um, these topics. That's not something that this algorithm does. We just say two topics and it gives us two topics. But we can look at it and say, well, this looks like politics related words. And then words that um, make up that topic might be something like government, law, Congress, vote, president, and so on. And for another topic, um, typical words for it if it's entertainment, say, um, typical words for it might be TV, Hollywood, actor, famous, and so on. So those are the two kind of principles. Each document is a mixture of topics, um, and the, the balance of this the percentages can vary. Um, and every topic is a mixture of a lot of different words. And um, these can kind of overlap, over, overlap. So for these two example topics, politics um, and entertainment, we might find a word like budget uh, relating to both politics and entertainment. So these, a word can be in several topics. So this is fuzzy, right? So a word doesn't have, isn't, isn't necessarily only associated with just one topic. It can be associated with two or more topics as well. Okay, so we'll go through um, two examples. And these are the packages that you need. So we have topic models, that's where the, the LDA um, algorithm is actually implemented. Tidy text, so that's um, text wrangling um, and tidy versus general um, data wrangling. And then 
Gutenberg are, so this is, um, we'll use data from Project Gutenberg um, later on. So Project Gutenberg has just a bunch of texts from um, books available. We'll, it lets you download texts into R and we'll use that. So I'm loading all of these. If you don't have them, you need to install them first. It's going to complain a little bit because my R is not, not quite updated, but hasn't caused any problems yet. So fingers crossed it won't. Um, and then we'll start with our first data set. So the topic models um, package comes with um, a couple of data frames and the associated press um, data frame is one of them, or it's actually not a data frame, but with data. So if you run this line, just data and then associated press, you'll see it pop up in your environment up here. So it's here now, and you, you'll notice um, it's a kind of a weird format. So if I run this, you can see it's called a document term matrix. Um, and we'll actually talk about that later. So this is a, a certain data structure that is necessary for um, the LDA to run. So the, the command needs the data to be in a specific structure. I'll show you with the second example, I'll show you how to get from text, just raw text, just uh, lines and pages of text, um, how to get from that to this document term matrix. Um, but you can already see, so it tells you, okay, we have some documents in here, 2000 and something, and we have some terms in here. Um, and the documents that we have in this case are actually news articles uh, from um, American News in roughly 88, 1988. And terms are just, these are just words, right? So we have 10,000-ish distinct words in this document term matrix. And we can actually have a look um, in a more readable format for us by just calling tidy on it. And then it looks like that. So you have document, these documents are just numbered. So they don't really have a title or anything. They're just numbered. And then you have a term, so just the word and you have a count. So in document one, the word adding occurs once. Uh, in the same document, the term adult occurs twice and so on. And you can kind of go through it and see, okay, document six, uh, sent three times, right? So these are just kind of document word counts for each document, each article in this case, how often does a term appear? So that's what's in it in a way. Um, and to do our topic modeling or to do our um, LDA, the function is just called that, just LDA. Um, then we need to call this, this matrix. So just associated press. So what's the data um, that, we're, that we're doing this topic modeling on? And the next argument is k, k equals two. So we're setting this to a number and this tells our algorithm how many models we want to create. So I've set it to two for this example to keep it kind of simple. Um, in reality, so in practice, you'll first of all, you'll have more data usually, and you'll also um, set K to a larger number. So you'll, you'll um, assume that your text has more than two topics. It might have a lot more than two topics. Um, there is, if you're interested, there is information on how to choose K because at the moment we have to just kind of pick a number that seems to make sense. Um, and it's a little bit tricky of figuring out how to choose K. So here's a, a blog post by Julia Silgi that goes through how you could do that. Um, and I won't really go into it because it would really like lead us way too far today. Um, the basic idea is that you um, kind of divide your entire text um, and then do topic modeling only on a, a percentage, so maybe two thirds of the text, and then use that um, topic model and apply it to the rest, to the new text that the model hasn't seen before. And then you use that to check how well it does on new data um, with different case. So with, with different numbers of um, topics, that's kind of the basic idea, but the blog post is really good. So if you're interested, um, you can, yeah, you can look at that. Uh, okay, should actually run this. And also this um, third line here, this is just for reproducibility. So I've set a seed. And what that means is that if you set if you use the same seed, we'll get the same output. 
um, if you don't do that, your output will look slightly different. So we're just doing that. So we're all looking at the same um, output. All right. So again, this is um, two topics. It's running on our um, newspaper articles from the US in 88. And this is just for reproducibility. All right, as you can see, this is not that much data. It does take a little bit to run, like it does take, so you shouldn't underestimate it. So now it's done. Um, and if we look at it, it's, it's not very informative, right? It just says, uh, says, so this is an LDA topic model with two topics. Uh, we kind of know that we set it to be that way, but we can extract information um, from it. And the first thing we'll do is we'll look at um, the probability of each word to be associated with each topic. This is called um, beta, the Greek uh, letter. And the way to do that is to use this tidy command, then call our LDA. That's just what we've called it for this data frame. And then the argument we need is um, matrix is beta. Okay, and let's look, let's look at that. So we've set two topics, right? And the first, column is just top, is it topic one or topic two, topic one, topic two. Uh, the second column is the term. So that's just the word. So we have error and abandon, it's just alphabetical, but it doesn't really matter. Um, and then the third column that we have is beta and beta shows the probability for each word to be associated with each topic, right? Um, so for Aaron, um, it's more likely that Aaron is in uh, topic two um, because this is a bigger number than this. <laughs> and to explain that a bit more, because this, this notation is not exactly intuitive. This is the scientific notation that a lot of you will probably just turn off um, every time they start uh, an R script. Um, but it is kind of useful to read it here, I feel like. Um, so if you have really small numbers, so these are going to be really, really small numbers, um, or if you have really large numbers in the millions, R will use this scientific notation. So it'll write the number and then it'll write E and then minus or sometimes plus some other number. And what that means is multiply the base number. So the number that is here um, by 10 to raised to the power of whatever this number is here. Um, so here's a handy, uh, command that lets you actually look at what that looks like. So it, let's say we have 1.4 and then E1. So this means 1.4 times 10 to the power of one, which is just 10. And that's 14. So you can also think of that as moving with the comma to the right, like one position to the right. So 1.4 moving the comma one position to the right is 14. We can try it with, um, same base number, but E2, so 1.4 um, times 10 to the power of two, so times 100, and then we have 140. So that would be moving the comma two positions to the right. So, so far we've used positive numbers, moving the comma to the right, um, and this makes, makes the number bigger kind of, um, but what happens if we do negative numbers? So if we have 1.4, um, e minus one, it's 0 0.14. So here you're moving the comma to the left by one. So it's 0 0.1 instead of 1.4. And then minus two moves the comma two positions to, um, two positions to the left. So 0 0.014 and so on, right? Um, so if we take one of these numbers here that we had, just, I'm just plugging this number in. So you can see, what that looks like in non-scientific notation is um, zero point and then 11 zeros and then actually the rest <laughs> the rest of the number right um, so if you have a minus here that means the number is really small and um, to to help you read this maybe so this number is bigger than this number because this number after e is bigger right it's a negative number so minus five is bigger than minus 12, right? I hope that helps you kind of read these kinds of tiny numbers. <laughs> Let me know if there's a question on this or on anything else. Okay, so again, if we extract um, beta, matrix equals beta, 
this is the probability for each word to come from which topic, right? So each word occurs twice here, and it has a probability associated with topic one and topic two, right? Okay, so to get a better sense of it, we can visualize that. So for each of our two topics, we want to find the 10 words with the highest beta, so with the highest probability to come from each of our two topics. So to start with that, uh, we can group by topic. And then for each topic, find the 10, n equals 10 uh, rows with the highest beta. So slice max means highest values of a certain variable. So I'll just do this, uh, execute these first four lines. Okay, so now you can see topic one, um, and then the term, so percent, million, new year, billion, last two, and so on. Um, these are for topic one, and these are the words with the highest beta from topic one. And then if we go to the second page, we have the same for topic two. So if I, president, government, people, Soviet, Bush, and so on, which dates the, <laughs> the data set somewhat. Okay, and now we can visualize that. Um, Oh yeah, we can first arrange it. Um, so um, arrange the topic um, by the, yeah by um, beta, so that it's it's ordered um, correctly, right? So we need reorder within here. And actually, I'll just show you the plot first because I feel like it's kind of hard to understand what I'm talking about. The plot we want to get to is just a bar graph from our two topics. Um, so topic one, these are the 10 words that are most associated with that topic. Uh, and the bars are just beta, right? So the longer the bar, the higher the probability. And then the same for topic two. Okay. So what we have here is a facet wrap. So doing this graph separately for topic one and topic two, facet wrap for topic. Um, and we want these terms to be ordered correctly from term with the highest beta to term with the lowest beta for each of these two topics. And that's often a bit tricky if you're using reorder with the facet wrap command. The ordering just sometimes doesn't work. So there's a little trick um, that you can use, which is this reorder within. So reorder um, the terms by beta within each topic, kind of do it separately for each topic. Um, and then the rest of the plot is, is probably like you're used to with ggplot. So we're showing um, beta and for each term, um, fill is going to be topic and we'll have to convert that into a factor because one and two usually will be treated as numbers. Um, this just says, don't show us the legend. We don't need that. Um, then the facet wrap and then scale Y reordered. We have to use that because we're doing this reorder within for the facet. So this is kind of a two-parter reorder within and scale Y reordered within the facets. And then this is just the theme, right? So basically if you're trying to make a bar graph and you're trying to sort um, whatever the variable is, but you're trying to sort something and it, it has a faceting command in it and it's not working probably, properly, uh, you need this reorder within um, and scale reordered commands. Okay. There's a question. Mm -hmm. uh, you say that the beta is the probability. However, it seems like all the betas are below 0.01. Does that mean that the terms are unlikely to be in either category or are we only interested for which category the beta is higher? Um, we're only we're interested in so here we're looking at the highest for each of the two topics and and the terms are so small because these are prob this is a probability and probabilities add up to one right so probability is always zero to one you can think of that as zero percent to one hundred percent and and because we're kind of splitting up this space between zero and one between thousands of words that's why these numbers are so tiny. But that's not an issue, right? That's just how the probability works. And here we're just showing the, um, yeah, we're just showing the words with the highest probability for each of the two topics. And you'll see that there's actually some overlap, right? So that just shows what I was saying earlier, that this is not exclusive, 
words can belong to both um, topics. So we have uh, to and year that we have in, in both topics, frequent in both topics. Right, so then it's not exactly the case that it shows the probability of that word showing up in that topic, but rather that topic is the whole probability space. And then mm -hmm. that word, the number shows how much of the probability space is taken up by that term. That's a good way of thinking about okay. it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so I was saying this is um, unsupervised and we don't really give any labels. We don't really give any names. We just say we want two topics. But obviously, obviously if we look at the words um, that we find here, we can label this as probably a like business and finance for topic one and politics um, for topic two. So we can kind of find our own um, labels um, that hopefully intuitively makes sense. All right. Yeah, so another, um, yeah, another number that we can, or another probability that we can extract from this is called gamma. Um, so this is for each document, um, what's the probability for that document being generated from each topic, right? So this is this, um, each document is a mixture of topics I was talking about. Uh, and the command is really similar as before, we just have to write matrix is gamma. Um, but it's again this tidy command. And that's what it looks like. So for document one, what's the probability that it's um, it belongs to topic one? And that's 0.248 and so on. For document two, 0.36 and so on, right? Um, so, and these are, so you can think of that as, uh, let's find one that has a really high, okay, here. So topic or document uh, 19 and 20 have 0.998. So that means that almost all words in documents 19 and 20 are from topic one, right? And only like roughly 1% of words is going to be from topic two, right? And then the opposite would be 18, where almost no words or very few words are from topic one. So almost all of them are from topic two, right? So that's how you can read that. Uh, and we can also have a look at the documents and see what they actually say. So um, we can use this tidy command again. So again, that, that just gave us the document, the term and how often the term occurred. And here we can filter to say we only want to see document 18. So document 18 is supposedly just or most, almost all words are supposed to be from topic two. So we can have a look at that and just look at um, the most frequent, frequent words here. That's what this does, arrange descending by count. So the most frequent words here are Bush, campaign, I, get, president, and so on, election. So if we think of topic two as kind of politics related, this makes sense. So this looks like it was classified correctly into this topic two, which is politics. All right. Yeah, so this was the first example um, with newspaper articles. And the second example is actually, we, we can put this method to the test if we know how many topics it should find or how many topics um, some text space should contain. So the way to do that, or the way we're going to do it, is we'll take um, three books um, and then we'll use topic modeling with k equals three because it comes from three books to try and see if our LDA can cluster the texts, so the, um, the chapters, the book chapters, back into the three topics and if the three topics then correspond to the books that we got the chapters from. All right, so basically testing it, uh, we know that this should be three topics because it's, it's three books, um, so we can test how well it does. And we're going to download data from Project Gutenberg uh, for this, so we're picking three books. Uh, so I'm just making a, an array here of these, a little list of these three titles. And then I'm using um, Gutenberg download. Um, and I'm checking if the title, book title, is in my titles list. And then this third um, line, this argument, this is this might be optional for you. So this is basically where should the books be downloaded from. Um, 
so yeah, where's the data stored? It's it's not just stored in one place, but it can be stored in lots of different places. And this is saying, where should it be downloaded from? I've had issues if I don't um, specify this mirror, so this kind of source. So that's why I have it. Um, okay, so we can look at, we should look at this books um, data that we have. And you can see we have the Gutenberg ID. So each book gets an ID, we can kind of ignore that. Then we have um, text and you can see it starts with some information on Project Gutenberg and then has the book title and then has um, yeah chapter one and the text starts and so on. And you can see it preserves the original line structure of the book. And then we have the title of the book and that's it. Right. So this is a format that you would likely get your text in, something like that, uh, at least. And we first will need to get it into this matrix that we need for LDA. Uh, okay. So the first thing we'll do is we'll treat each chapter in the book as our document. So instead of having newspaper articles, we'll have book chapters. These will be the documents um, that we're using. So we need to actually add that as a variable that's not in um, the data yet. So we need to do that. Um, and the way we can do that is we need to find, so wherever in the book text, it says chapter one, we need to find that. And we need to put that into a variable that tells us which chapter a line is from. That's what we'll do first. Because that needs to be done separately for each book, we first need to group by title. So title is just book title. Um, and then to find a chapter, we can use a regular expression. So that's this part. So the regular expression finds chapter followed by a space um, at the beginning of a line. That's what that means. So at the beginning of a line, and we've also set ignore case to true, because sometimes you might have chapter in, in lower case, or you might have it in um, upper case. Um, and this is within the string detect um, command. And string detect um, looks at text. So looks at our text variable, looks at our um, book text, and when it finds this regular expression, when it finds chapter, it returns true. It says true, I found it. And if it doesn't, it returns false. Okay, and now this is wrapped in cumulative sum. So this cumulative sum uh, command. Uh, and you can think of that as a counter that starts at zero. And every time this string is detected, every time we find chapter, it counts up by one, right? And that way we can get the chapter information. Um, yeah, this way we can extract it and we'll write it in a, a variable called chapter. So we're making a new variable called chapter and I'll just run it uh, up to here so you can see what that looks like. So we still have our normal you know, line by line structure and here we have chapter zero because it starts at zero. And then if we move on, it starts, it jumps to chapter one at some point. So we can see here's the line chapter one. And that's when it starts, yeah, uh, counting up to chapter one. And once we get to chapter two, um, this variable will also read two and so on and so forth. Um, all right. And it does that separately for each book is we've grouped by book, grouped by title. Um, okay, then we want to get rid of everything that's chapter zero. So you can see chapter zero here. The actual text is just um, the book title and some information from Project Gutenberg and a whole bunch of empty lines that we don't need. So we'll filter to chapter um, bigger than zero to just get rid of that. Um, and then the last thing we'll do. So at the moment we have uh, title and chapter as two different uh, two different columns, right? So we have title, book title, and chapter. And we'll use unite to put them into, to put them together. So to have title and then underscore chapter, um, and we'll call that document. That will be our document. And that way we have just one identifier for each document, right? Because we want to keep that information to be able to later test if our LDA was, yeah, was doing a good job. Okay, uh, let me actually run that. <laughs> okay, 
So now we have, as you can see, document is just the book title, underscore chapter, chapter one, and so on. And chapter zero is gone because we don't need that. OK, so next we, we still have the text in, in different lines. Uh, next, we need to split it up into words. Um, and that's when we can use unnest tokens. So this is a function that you'll almost always need <laughs> need if you do text analysis with uh, tidy text. So that um, splits up each of our lines into the individual words, right? So now you have um, the word column that we just made with unnest tokens, and each word is on its separate line, right? So you can see a shifting reeve and so on. Okay, so one word per line. And you can see now we have a, a much longer data frame as before. Okay, and now we still need to count how often each word occurs in each chapter, right, in each of our um, documents. Um, and we're doing that here with count. And actually one step before that is we're getting rid of stop words. So stop words are words that don't have, um, that don't contribute a lot to um, the content of uh, a document. So something like the, a, and words like those. Uh, and we don't really need them um, for LDA. We can um, safely get rid of them. So we're doing this with an anti-join and stop words. So stop words is a, a data frame that comes with uh, tidy text, I think. And that's just going to get rid of all our stop words. Um, right. So I'll do that first. So you can see that it it's a smaller data frame, right? It has fewer rows. It got rid of um, a bunch of the non-content words, more like grammatical words. It got rid of that. Um, and then we're going to count for each document, for each chapter, we're going to count how often each word occurs. Okay. Okay, so we can see for great expectations, chapter 57, Joe occurs 88 times. Um, for chapter 23, pocket 53 times and so on. And this is done for each of our chapters. Yeah, so that's, we're pretty close to what we need for LDA, but the format isn't quite right. Uh, so we need this document term matrix, uh, and there's a really handy function um, that we can use, which is cast DTM. So we're using our word counts. So again, that's just document, word, and then N. So how often the word occurred in each document. And we're calling cast DTM. And cast DTM wants to know the document, uh, the word, and how often it occurs and what these columns are called. Right? So we'll run that. And to explain what that actually is, so this document term matrix. Um, so this just has the document um, that a word came from, what the word is, and how often it occurs. Um, that's what we have here, but with this document term matrix, if um, a word doesn't occur in a document, it just doesn't appear in our word counts, right? So if pocket is not in a certain chapter, it just won't appear in that chapter. Um, but what's happening here is that it needs to be in a format where if a word doesn't appear in a document, it still needs to turn up, but just with frequency zero, right? Um, so words that have frequency zero in our word counts just don't turn up. Um, but in the uh, document term matrix, they will appear, right? Um, so we can actually, let's quickly look at that again. All right. Yeah, so it tells us 166 documents, so chapters and 16,000 uh, terms, so words, and it tells us something about the sparsity. So this is a sparse matrix, and what that means is that most entries are zero. So most of the words in there have a frequency of zero, don't occur in most documents, right? So this is called a sparse um, matrix. 
Okay, so now we have our data in the right format. And now we can run the LDA. And here we know that K um, should be three uh, because we have it. We have three books. We want to actually check uh, if the LDA is doing a good job of kind of sorting them back, sorting the chapters back into the books they came from. Uh, so that's why we have K3. And we're going to run that. Uh, yeah, and again, this seed is just for reproducibility. So we're getting the same output if you're also running the code. Um, so you're getting the same output. All right, and it's done. That was pretty quick. Okay, so now we can again look at uh, the probability of each word being generated in each topic. So that was beta. So we can look at that. Okay, and now we can see here, because we have three topics, we have one, two, three, right? not two like before. So this will change depending on how many topics we set. And for each term, for each word, we again have this beta. Um, so for Joe, if we look at that, uh, we have the highest probability of Joe being in topic one rather than topic two or three, right? Because this is again, this is the largest number, right? And this is done for each of these terms. And again, we can visualize it. So just like before, uh, we'll take again the 10 uh, words per topic with the highest beta and visualize that. So the code here is, is pretty much the same as before. So you can see topic one, uh, typical words for that is our Joe, Miss, Time, Pip, Looked, and so on. Two is Captain, Nautilus, C, Nemo, and so on. And three is Elizabeth, Darcy, Miss, Bennett, Jane, and so on. So it looks like broadly, this seems to have worked. So topic one should be great expectations when looking at these words. Topic two, 20,000 leagues under the sea, right? C is even in there. And three should be pride and prejudice. Okay, so broadly this kind of worked, but it'll be interesting here to look at the per document, per topic um, probability, so gamma. So to look at that, we have each document, so each chapter from each book, um, and the percentage of each chapter being from which topic, right? The percentage of words um, in this chapter, in this document, being from which topic. So here we see great expectations, um, and there are really high probabilities for uh, all these great expectations um, chapters to be sorted into topic one, right? So we can get, kind of go through that. Here, interestingly, we have 20,000 leagues under the sea also, oh no, having a low probability to be in topic one. So that seems right, because topic one should be great expectations. Um, but ideally we should visualize that because this is really hard to you know, get much information out of. So to do that, we would first like to split up this column document. We'll split it back into book and chapter, right? At the moment it's book underscore chapter, but we want to split it back up into book in one column and chapter in a separate column. Um, and we used unite to kind of glue them together and separate is just the opposite of that. So separate is to kind of take them apart again. So we're using this chapters gamma um, data frame and we would like to separate the document column and the columns that we want to separate this into should be called title and chapter. Um, the separator is an underscore. And convert um, true, this is just because um, we'll treat chapter as an integer, as a number. Otherwise, it'll be treated as a character. OK, let's do that. And you can see it's split it up. So title and chapter split the two up. Um, and now we can visualize that. So I wanted just this title, the book information to be on its own so we can actually visualize um, gamma for it. Okay, so here's, yeah, this is what we're doing. We're using facet wrap again because we want one visualization for each book. And then the, uh, we want a box plot for gamma for each of these topics, right? Um, and what we can see here, if we start on the right, so 20,000 leaks under the sea, uh, you can see that for topics one and three, gamma is really low, right? So there are a few chapters that have 
um, a gamma of, I don't know, maybe 0.05 or something um, for topic one and three, but that's really low. Most chapters are going to have a high um, gamma for chapter, uh, for topic two. Okay, so that's up here. For Pride and Prejudice, similar picture. So for uh, topics one and two, the gamma is going to be low on average. And then for topic three, it's really high. So for, for these two books, it worked really well um, because we want gamma to be really high for topic three, if topic three is Pride and Prejudice. Uh, for Great Expectations, uh, it didn't work quite as well, still worked pretty well. So Great Expectations should then be topic one. And we can see, yeah, um, a lot. So the gamma for um, topic one is pretty high overall, but there are a couple of kind of stragglers, a couple of chapters for which gamma is more like 0.5. And there are also a couple of chapters that got a high-ish gamma for topic three, right? So overall worked pretty well. Um, for great expectations, it worked less well than for the others. Can, so there's a general question. Uh -huh. um, what sort of effect does removing the stop words have on the actual topic modeling? Since these words probably occur with comparable frequency in each text, they shouldn't uh, impact the allocation that much, should they? Yeah, they shouldn't really. Um, yeah, they shouldn't really influence the uh, the allocation much because they'll be pretty frequent in all of these documents. Uh, so that doesn't give us a lot of information. Um, so yeah, I think. Uh, this is more to make our matrix a bit smaller, so to make our model run a bit faster if it has to think about less or think about fewer words rather, um, then it can run maybe a little bit faster. I don't think it would be awful if you left them in. I think it's more of a convenience thing to make it, uh, to make the document term matrix a bit smaller uh, and to make the algorithm run a bit faster. Yeah, does that answer the question? <laughs> but I think you're you're right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I have some more on kind of exploring this assignment and um, yeah, figuring out what went well and what what went wrong a little bit. But I also really want to give you a chance to explore this for yourselves. Uh, so I would kind of suggest that you take a look at the um, exercises or like exercise suggestions, if you like. Um, so the suggestion here, of course, you can pick any text space that you like, but there are um, on Tidy Tuesday, there are uh, Beyonce lyrics and Taylor Swift lyrics. So I thought that would be a nice, um, yeah, nice text for topic modeling. Uh, so if you like, you can read those in uh, and have a look. So these will be in a format that need a little bit of wrangling, that need a little bit of um, yeah, text analysis to get them to this document term matrix. And if you want to visualize um, these, there are two um, color palettes available, of course. So there's one for kind of Taylor Swift colors, one for Beyonce colors. Um, and one more note is that we're getting rid, so we're using this kind of um, pre-made stop word list, but for song lyrics, there are a couple of additional uh, words that you might want to exclude, right? All right, um, yeah. Yeah, so feel free to give that a go um, and I'll be here to, to answer any questions and in maybe seven-ish minutes, I can show you what I did um, but you can just yeah play around with that a little bit. 